Welcome to the Institute for Strategic Policy Solutions. My name is Kimberly Jackson and I'm the Executive Director. We are honored today to do a program on cyber hacking. But before we begin, I'd like to share a little bit about the Institute and its purpose. The Institute for Strategic Policy Solutions was created by former Congressman Bill Young. He wanted to have a think tank located in the heart of our college to address social, political, and economic issues in a nonpartisan way. In essence, he wanted to discuss the scope of government. We're proud to house ISPS at the Seminole campus, and we hope that you learn more about our think tank by going to isps.sbcollege.edu. I'm further honored to introduce our speakers for today. These are experts in the industry, and they're gonna share a lot of knowledge. Our first speaker is James McQuiggan. James is a security awareness advocate for the Know Before Company, responsible for amplifying the Know Before messaging related to the importance of effectiveness of and the need of new school security awareness training within organizations through social media, webinars, in-person presentations, industry trade shows, and traditional media outlets. Prior to joining Know Before, James worked for Siemens for 18 years, where he was responsible for various roles over that time. James was the product and solution security officer, Siemens Gamesa Renewable Energy. He consulted and supported various corporate divisions on cybersecurity standards, information security awareness, and security product networks. In addition to his work at Siemens, James is also a part-time faculty professor at Valencia College in the Engineering, Computer Programming, and Technical Division. Within the Central Florida community, he is the president of the Central Florida ISC2 chapter, supporting cybersecurity professionals with meetings, education, and networking opportunities. Working with the Center for Cybersecurity, excuse me, working for the Center for Safe Cyber Safety, I'm going to break it up right here. Working with the Center for Cyber Safety and Education, James has taught the safe and secure online education and awareness program to over 7,000 students, parents, teachers, and the life experience to ensure they understand the dangers of the internet. James is the father of two teenage daughters and continues to make sure they are safe and secure online while using their smartphones and social media. And I'd like to add after speaking with them over the past couple of months, I am certain that you will learn a lot about the importance of safety in this new age. Our next speaker today is John Just. John Just is a national leader in e-learning and has provided expert advice to many enterprises across the United States, including Fortune 500 and nonprofit firms. He is currently the Senior Vice President of Know Before, the world's largest cybersecurity awareness training organization. Dr. Just was formerly Senior Vice President of Education Solutions for Inthrive, where he led development and custom e-learning services that provided industry-leading e-learning to over 2 million learners. He has held positions as IT director and web design instructor at Florida Virtual School, instructional design and technology professor at University of Tampa, chief information officer at Pinellas County Schools and co-founder and head of school at Pinellas Virtual School. He earned a bachelor's degree from Pennsylvania State University, a master's degree in instructional technical technology from the University of South Florida and a doctorate in instructional technology and distance education from Nova Southeastern University. I'm very honored to have these two heavyweights in the industry join us today. Thank you so much. Gentlemen. So I'm gonna go ahead and start sharing my screen here because I have a little, little presentation. Um, yeah, this looks like it's the right one. Oh, let's get rid of that. Very good, all right, so playing the cyber virtual bingo hopefully you can hear me and you can see me and so there's two boxes for you there on your uh, on your conference card uh, bingo card so what i'm going to talk about for pretty well the next 10 minutes and just do it at a very high level is kind of give you some insight into how the bad guys the cyber criminals people like to call them hackers i think hackers are good people too because hackers are people that like to take things apart figure out how they work and then put them all back to put it all back together again. Uh, I've been doing that since I was about five when I took apart my parents' tube TV um, and had it laid out in the family room, and they came in and they were all freaked out. Uh, but I did get it all back together and it worked fine. 
But I want to just kind of go over some concepts, the way that cyber criminals work, uh, just to give you that kind of an awareness. I think awareness is important because it helps you understand something a little more. So looking at how the bad guys attack. This is a very simple, high level concept. But one way that a lot of cyber criminals will operate is they will scour the internet, search the internet, and they have a lot of free programs that you, anybody can get. And they'll do a search for email addresses for a particular company. Let's say they're targeting one specific organization. They'll look for email addresses for that organization, collect them all up into a big list, create a very crafty, well-worded email, even though people have been saying for years, oh, you can spot a phishing email because of the typos and the bad English. Well, they've gotten a lot better. And so they'll, with the spear phishing emails, they will craft it really well. And they will send it to all the people within that organization. And essentially what they're doing is they're looking for that one person to be able to click that link and essentially open up the front door for uh, the bad guys to be able to come into that organization. Um, but you know, opening up the front door to, to your home and letting the bad guys in and come take whatever they want is essentially kind of the same thing. Essentially the way, and I kind of touched upon it already with them scouring the email. Um, but basically, before a, an attack happens, you have the, the cyber criminal is going to do reconnaissance. And that's part of that gathering up of email addresses. They might do research on the company, want to figure out, um, you know, who are the uh, senior management, because they might try to use that. But they're going to do their own reconnaissance using a variety of different tools to um, learn as much as they can. Then they're going to craft together that email. They're going to create that weapon, essentially. They might attach, uh, there might be a link in that email or an attachment, and in that will contain the, uh, the malware, uh, the malicious software that is going to use to attack the organization, steal files um, or whatever. And so that message then gets delivered, and then they're waiting for that person to click on the link. Then the exploitation begins. Essentially, as I said, you've now opened up the front door. The bad guys are inside the network. They're able to work their way around. They're uh, extremely uh, agile in the sense that they can figure out from what computer they're on to you know, how to get to different systems on the network, take control of those, all the while uh, unknown to the uh, organization. Then they may install additional malware. They might even look at um, adding things that allow them to keep control of the, uh, of the system and access to that. Then afterward, they're going to do a command and control. And this is a lot of the times they're reaching back out uh, from that organization back to their website to download additional data or additional files, malicious software, or they're starting an exfiltration of data if they found data that they can steal. And then they basically are acting on those objectives. Now, what I've described here essentially is what we call the cybersecurity kill chain. And this is developed by uh, Lockheed Martin, but it pretty well goes through step by step giving you an understanding of how the criminals are going to work. Figure out about the, the target, come up with the email or the phishing email they're going to do, send it, hope for somebody to click on the link, and then exploit the organization and then uh, keep control of it. So a phishing, I already said, it's kind of like opening up the front door, letting the bad guys into your organization. Even Noblefor has been a target. We This came in through our uh, through our environment where it was like, hey, it's time for your training. The email is very well crafted, very similar but it was the web address that was different that caught a lot of buddy's eyes where it says training.nob.e4.com. Well, somebody that's going through and says, oh, okay, I got to do my training. All right. And they go in, they click on the link are now going to be uh, taken to a different website that may look like a no before website. Um, but essentially they've clicked on the, uh, the bad guy site. One of the outcomes that comes with phishing is uh, ransomware and ransomware is pretty well one of the top ways that cyber criminals are getting access and maintaining it and still getting money from these organizations. Uh, they'll get in through a variety of different ways, uh, whether it's uh, misconfigured equipment facing on the internet or it's phishing. And phishing is still one of the more popular ways that they use. They'll get in, they'll steal credentials or create their own on the network, uh, work their way through, figure out what's on the network, come up with ways to maintain that access and then drop the ransomware payload. Essentially, with a ransomware attack, that can happen as, quick, as quickly as in 17 minutes. Um, there's one particular uh, ransomware that's out there. It just encrypts. 
but it's it's not on you're not able to decrypt it without paying but they can basically get in and drop it within 17 minutes um, you have another one that can take up anywhere between two and 29 hours but a lot of the time detection of the bad guys inside your network takes days um, or it takes up to days before somebody realizes something's going on. They're very stealthy and they're very careful about what they're doing inside the network. So that's just kind of a quick high level look at how they get into your network and what they're gonna do. One of the things that um, with today's discussion, uh, I know that the, the topic of Oldsmar had come up. Um, I had spent 18 years working at Siemens and was responsible for making sure that those power plants were secure uh, for our customers. Well, so that gave me a lot of exposure to that environment. And essentially in industrial control system environments, whether that's power plants, water treatment plants, whether it's manufacturing facilities, transportation, logistics, um, those are all what we call operational technology environments, OT environments. And within that OT environment, you're going to have that industrial control system, um, specifically what's called a SCADA system. And SCADA is supervisory control and data acquisition. That's what's controlling these environments. And that's what a lot of the time that um, cyber criminals are, are wanting to try and gain access, because if they can get to one of those, then they can either shut it down or they can cause uh, damage. So again, the SCADA system, they're pretty well, they're everywhere and you may not even realize it. Like I said, water treatment, manufacturing, uh, power plants, uh, you all have these supervisory control and data acquisition, those SCADA sites. And there's a lot of different uh, manufacturers out there. I'm not gonna go into this um, greatly, but uh, a lot of time people are going, well, how many attacks have there been? Well, specific ones in ICS, um, starting back in 2010, you know, there's been, you know, there's been like seven, seven or eight dedicated strictly for targeting power plants, energy, industrial control system environments. They are coming more up in number, um, but as cyber criminals start to become more aware of them. One of the things that these industrial control systems environments, one, what they need to have and make sure they've got up, they have set up as a defense in depth environment using different technologies, uh, different kinds of firewalls, but creating essentially a layered network um, from the internet through to a DMZ, the corporate network, getting on to um, the different aspects of, of the, uh, the network. Now you've got your DMZ, a demilitarized zone essentially is what that is. It's a, an area that's exposed to the internet, um, but it's where the organization will use to have uh, maybe file servers or um, other servers or data that they um, are kind of putting out there and making available, but not able to, to get inside the, uh, the corporate network. But essentially all the way at the bottom, you have the controllers for the different parts of your, your SCADA system. Um, and essentially you wanna limit the access each of those layers. So when you get down to the very bottom, you have a very small list of people that can actually get to those systems. Um, so that way, if a cyber criminal does get in, they have to make sure they got the right person uh, to be able to work their way down all the way into the um, into that environment. That layer defense also includes training and awareness, having certain technologies, um, endpoint technology, your, your client systems. So it's important that you have that in there. Um, one of the things that I do on the side is I'm a college professor at Valencia College here in Orlando, and pretty well every semester I start off by showing the students all the um, devices that are connected to the internet. And a lot of the time we find 1.5, well last time we found 1.5 million open remote desktop protocol sessions. These are servers that are connected directly to the internet that allow you to have remote access into one of the servers in the organization. Usually you wanna have that behind a firewall. Having that sitting right on the internet is kind of like a smorgasbord for the cyber criminals that are out there, easy enough for them to go after. Um, so if you wanna learn more about SCADA, there's a, there's a fun little book called SCADA and Me written by Robert Lee. Uh, I've known him for years. It's a great little book. Um, it, it's written like a children's book, but um, it's kind of something fun to check out. So that's kind of me real quick in about 11 minutes. So I think now I'm going to turn it on over to John and he's got some more great information to share with you. Thanks, James. Let me stop sharing. There we go. Appreciate that.
So you may or may not know this. Many of you, I think, are from the Tampa Bay area, but um, know before we do um, security awareness training uh, and simulated fishing, we help organizations manage the ongoing problem of social engineering. And we are the world's uh, leading provider of security awareness um, training and simulated fishing. And we're based right here in the Tampa Bay area. Um, so what do we do um, to combat what James was just talking about? So we're trying to take people from checking the box of, you know, hey, I've done my security awareness training because everybody for years and years has been checking that box of, okay, it's done. I've done my security awareness training to building, I, I like to say a home and work firewall that benefits both the organization and the employee. So I like to look at this as an employee benefit as well as um, an organizational benefit. And as James sort of touched on, what we're looking at and what happened with Oldsmar is sort of what I like to refer to as the tip of the iceberg. So what we're seeing is, and this is not, it's increasing um, as we speak. It's funny what gets covered by the media and what we hear about and what is actually happening. And a lot of this, or a lot of uh, what we're hearing about in the media is the tip of the iceberg, but we're all personally sort of seeing this ourselves, right? We might get phishing emails ourselves. We might get text messages or, or robocalls, or we might get calls from people saying, hey, I'm from Microsoft tech support and I need access to your computer or weird pop-up messages um, that tell us that we need to install certain things. Um, so University of Maryland recently said that there every 36 seconds, there are uh, cyber attacks that are occurring. Um, and another misconception that's out there is that this is happening to large organizations because that's what we hear in the news. That's what we hear th that's being targeted. So when we hear City of Oldsmar and we hear some of these other things, we say, well, why is that a target? Um, so we'll get into that in some of the questions later on, but it's a, it's a misconception that it's only the big guys that people are going after. And it's only people who have money. Um, uh, James mentioned uh, students. I heard some stories from students recently where they were being attacked and money was taken out of their accounts. And these are you know college students, right? Community college students who only have hundreds of dollars in their account. And yet cyber criminals are going after them. Um, and then phone-based fraud and scams are, are on the rise as well. So as we have this interconnected uh, network that puts everything at our fingertips and makes everything so readily available and convenient for us, it's amazing how convenient it is. It comes with a lot of, um, a lot of scary things that cyber criminals are able to take advantage of. So what we're, what we're hearing about in the media is really just the tip of the iceberg. Um, and what we're trying to build is that human firewall. And uh, so what is a firewall? You heard James refer to it. So it's designed to block, block unauthorized access, permitting only authorized communications. So it can either be hardware or software that's configured to permit or deny uh, traffic based on some rules that we set up, some criteria and there are several different types of firewalls. So a human firewall is users that are trained not to fall for social engineering tricks. Or I'll add on to this definition to identify social engineering tricks, to be part of an organization that is, is kind of looking around and going, that's, that's weird, that's odd, that seems out of place. Um, and, and these can come in person attacks, they can be, they can come online and identify them and say, I don't think this should be occurring and alerting the authorities and alerting uh, the security personnel or alerting the IT department so that an intervention can occur as quickly as possible. And that can be as important as the technical controls that are put in place. And, and some might argue more important. So social engineering has been around for a long time. 
But the ability for us to connect together in the ways that we're, I just mentioned, um, this art of manipulating, influencing, or deceiving in order to gain control of your computer system or, or other devices, phones, uh, e even via uh, mail fraud um, or gain illegal access um, it, it is become, it, the proliferation of that um, has become so much more due to the internet and, and this, uh, this vast connectivity. Um, so our approach uh, to having managed this problem is moving people from the old school. And the old school is let's train people for an hour. And really old school is let's, let's buy everybody donuts. Let's put them all in a room. Uh, I guess with COVID, we can't, we can't put everybody in a room anymore, but let's, let's think pre pre uh, pandemic. Um, and let's watch a video about how this, how, what, what the dangers are. Um, but that kind of evolved into, okay, now let's put that same sort of punishment online and death by PowerPoint. And most, most of the material is forgotten. I, I put in a couple of months. I would argue that most of the material within a few minutes of the presentation being over or I'm multitasking on my email and most of it's forgotten then, right? And I'm thinking, why do I even have to do this? That's a big problem, what I showed earlier. That, that tip of the iceberg is actually um, one of the infographics we put in a lot of our training. Because a lot of our end users think, this can't happen to me. I'm not going to be part of this attack. And one of the things we want to explain to them as part of our training is it can happen to you personally, and it can happen to you professionally as well. And so you need to have awareness that this is happening all the time. And as part of that, you need to be ongoing awareness that this threat is out there. And, um, and, and so, you know, it's not about, um, you know, uh, just the willingness, just the knowledge that I have in my head, but it's the willingness in the understanding that this is going on and that I need to be a part of this, um, that in the motivation um, that needs to be created. So that's a big part of what we do with our training materials as well. And it's a big part of what we try to do to encourage a change in culture in organizations. We can't just do that through the training materials. It has to be done from the leadership within organizations. It has to be done um, all throughout the pervasive throughout an organization to have a mindset of preparedness for these sort of uh, eventualities that are just a matter of time uh, before uh, something like what happened to Oldsmar happens within any number of organizations. And it and old school is lastly is also more of a legal compliance checkbox. Okay, we've done it. We've given you training. If you go and mess up and click on something like James mentioned and enter your, your username and password, and, uh, and then someone uses that username and password later, and they get access to something. We, we, you know, we did the old CYA thing and we covered ourselves. And, um, and so, you know, it's your fault. It's not the organization's fault. New school, which is what we, we try to promote at New Before, Know Before, is at least quarterly training, although monthly training is really recommended. And it's not 45 minutes or an hour. It's smaller segments of training. So over the length of the time, we're not trying to cut away from everybody's got to do their job. So organizations that are on here, you know, police officers still have to be actively out in the community policing, um, you know, fire, fire departments, um, you know, uh, we have to still be teaching students, we still have to be doing the things we do. We have our jobs to do within the our organizations. We don't want to cut into that time. So we want to take that same amount of time and spread it over a long, longer period of time. So it might be five to six minute interactions that are spread over a longer period of time. But there's more consistency there and there and it's more about motivation. And then changing it to be more edutainment oriented so that it's content that engages the learners. It's highly interactive and it includes simulations. So simulated phishing. These are not, we're trying to catch you by sending you simulated fish 
that, that pretends to be the bad guys. They're actually education opportunities. They're opportunities to actually uh, practice and to see what the bad guys would be actually doing. And then they have landing pages when you click on them and say, oops, you clicked on this. And they might have educational information. Um, and they're not punitive. We don't, when you click on them, we don't go come over and go, why did you do that? Um, they're more about, hey, this could have been a real um, you know, bad person on the other end of this. And this could have been bad consequences for you. It could have been bad consequences for you personally, for our organization. But in this case, it was a simulation. And, the, and simulations are good learning tools. Uh, we know that through research. Um, we know that that's a good, uh, a good thing. And you could have, this could have been your personal banking information. And an ongoing readiness it, it is that it's useful. The biggest compliment I get, um, I wear my know before shirt and I often go to education conferences and I'll be in other people's uh, boots. And I got a lot of really great compliments about our educational materials, about our training materials. Um, you know, they're fun, they're engaging, they're interesting. I'm going to show you uh, quick little samples of, of some of our educational materials. Uh, but the biggest thing that I'll get from some of our, uh, the biggest compliment I get is that, man, they're useful. And that's what we really want to drive home. Useful organ for the organization and useful for them personally. And, it, and it's an employee benefit to them too, because they're, like I mentioned, they may be getting attacked personally, um, you know, they, they may be getting um, uh, members of their family that they can inform about these sort of attacks. So it becomes an employee benefit, not just the, the fact that um, we're making the organization safe as well. So moving to new school also inv involves having some variety. Um, we call them training modules. These are self-paced interactive modules that have a quiz at the end. They do resemble a little bit of the death by PowerPoint, but rather than it being death by PowerPoint, they're highly interactive and have knowledge checks in between and they're multimedia oriented and um, they're more fun and engaging and multimedia in, in nature. And then we have video modules. Um, so these might be animated or live action video and they can be short three to five minute videos that are just reminders of why it's important to have a strong password and not reuse a password so many times um, or give out your password to somebody um, or enter your password into a site you're not completely sure that that's the, the exact site. Um, it's very, very important. Um, and then we have assessments and surveys because you wanna reach out to within your organization, engage that culture that I mentioned earlier. How, how what take a pulse? What are we, what is it feeling like within the organization? How do people feel about their individual responsibility? How do few people feel about the leadership? And are, are we resonating with the organization that we feel as though the security culture is important within the organization? Are we doing enough and measuring the, um, the aptitude as well as the culture within the organization? And then supplementary materials. These can include posters, newsletters, artwork, and other materials um, that really, you want to train like a marketer. Uh, marketing does a great job of this, where they're, they have all kinds of materials all over the place um, that they're sort of uh, plastering in our faces, right? And so rather than having um, this once a year, we're going to give you this 45-minute training or 30-minute training, They've got, you know, I, I like the, you know, those Bud Light campaigns. They've got the poster at the site you, you buy it. They've got the online video. They've got, you know, the desktop backgrounds. They've got the social media. This could be same thing. We could have it on our intranet. Um, you know, we could have it uh, at our place of work. We can have uh, these posters and these reminders so that these are constantly with the same sort of imagery uh, reminding folks of these important messages and having it be front of mind that cybersecurity is very important and is going to resonate with them. And with that, I just would like to, uh, I'm going to stop sharing PowerPoint here and I'm going to show just a couple of quick examples because I think it's hard to visualize exactly what I'm talking about when I'm talking about no school, new school. I'm going to show a trailer of one of our new video 
um, modules, which is a video series we call the Inside Man. And the Inside Man is a, a series um, that is basically follows a, a, a former um, cyber criminal hacker. I'll be more specific since hackers can be white hat and black hat hackers. And, uh, and basically, did I share the sound? I hope I did. Uh, let me try that one more time. And uh, basically, it follows him around. And he turns, uh, I, mean, I don't want to spoil it for people if they haven't watched it yet, but he does turn, turn white hat at some point. Um, and this is our season three. And it's basically like a Netflix series, but it's educational in, in nature and it kind of follows him around. So this is for our trailer for season three of that series. Get your number, I pull the strings Face of an angel, touch me, I'll sting Raising the pulse to watch you flatline I'm in your circle, reeling you in It's happening! Finally! The bank's about to invest a substantial sum in a state-of-the-art remote banking service Every transaction requires a, an interview that is different every time Absolutely unbreachable You have two weeks to hack Berry Bank Kidnapping someone is clearly the simplest path. <laughs> <laughs> we are going to need somebody who can appear to be somebody else. This woman has worked in TV and film. She's done a bunch of facial recognition work for Google. I'm fascinated with faces. You know, the micro expressions, the non-verbal cues that we send off and pick up on. Yeah, I like faces too. And you really think you can do all this? We may have to cross a lot of lines. I want you to train me, but no more friendly neighborhood office manager. Say you're a wolf. Ah. Finally getting out in the field. And to get toys. AJ, you're going to be in the van. Is it going to be an actual van this time? Gold leader, this is Red Five standing by. The next step is the only one that really matters. In position, I'm taking control of his laptop. Death Rage, you're set your end. God, this is taking forever. Sorry, guys, their system's lagging. I don't think we've met. Do you work here? I, I don't. I'm, uh... I think I better call security just to make sure. There's no time to breathe. We film the target, we hack the target, we fake out the person asking the questions, and we move the money. It's easy. Find him. Now. And one more super quick example. Another thing we like to use a lot um, is games and gamification. Um, so in this game in particular, you're, you're racing against the hacker. So you're answering questions after you've done some learning. And this is a five minute game. And there's an unlocked workstation that's been left um, unattended. And it has customer data and payroll information on it. And you have to answer, you pick your avatar at the beginning of the game. There's uh, music playing there, I'll mute the music. So I'm gonna pick my, uh, my avatar. And it's gonna ask you about, you know, things like reusing passwords here. And uh, if I'm incorrect, I'm spinning the wheel on behalf of the hacker. So the hacker is going to go in front of me. Everyone in the organization. There, I got that one correct. If I'm correct, I'm spinning in, in, as me. So this is just a fun way for me to you know, reinforce what I've learned. Um, we, have a, we have many other games, we have 25 different games. Um, but again, mixing it up where I get to play a five minute game one month versus, um, you know, death by PowerPoint, um, the old school way. Um, so that's all I have for my, my presentation. Um, I think we're on to the, the questions. Absolutely. First of all, thank you both for your patience. I appreciate it. And so it's quite, again, as we've been talking over the past month, the learning curve. One thing that I want to say is that you know, um, your information is very informative, but it does make people quite paranoid. 
<laughs> we talked about the fact that, that um, you know, from a human capacity, our brains are not wired to constantly be on guard. And essentially what you're teaching is for us to constantly be on guard in both our personal and our professional life. And that brings about challenges. You both mentioned Oldsmar. I was hoping that you can comment briefly on the factual space of why it matters in terms of our other vulnerable spaces in government and private entities. And then talk a little bit about what I said about that human capital before we get into um, questions from our, our, our participants. All right, I'll tackle the Oldsmar part, um, mainly because when this, this happened back in February, um, uh, a lot of my former colleagues that I worked with and worked within the industry, worked at Siemens and worked in the industry, this was uh, a very hot discussion, a very hot topic for us. Um, but one of the things that uh, came out of it uh, or that in our discussions was the, the fact that, and this is all based on information that we'd received. There's no inside information. I haven't talked to anybody at Oldsmar. Just, just get that out of the way. But just in discussions of what was presented, um, the person had connected earlier in the day, uh, moved the mouse around a little bit, tried to see some stuff, and then came back later on that day, um, or there was a second connection later on that day, and they ended up changing a value to something that was so astronomical. Um, one of the things and one of the comments that came out of the discussions that I, I personally took to heart was the fact that there are a lot of checks and balances within those environments, whether it's a power plant, whether it's a water treatment facility or manufacturing, they're going to have stop measures and gaps, balance, checks and balances throughout the environment in that SCADA system to make sure that you know, whatever the value is being set, whether it, it meets the parameters or not. And so even if that 11 million or, or whatever the value was had been set, Further down the line, there are mechanical uh, switches and valves and, and everything else that would have basically seen that and it would have overridden it um, because of the stop measures and things they had in there. Now, if they bumped it up, maybe 10% of the value, that might have been something that might have been able to go through. But there's a lot of, it's not an instantaneous thing. Um, the other aspect is a lot of people complained about, oh my gosh, why isn't there enough cybersecurity on, on the plan? How could somebody just get into the environment? And a lot of the industrial control system environments operate on the notion of availability. Within cybersecurity, there's three concepts that we have. It's confidentiality, integrity, and availability. Confidentiality is being able to protect it, encrypt it. Integrity is, sorry, confidentiality is all about authorization. Integrity is all about encryption, making sure you can't change it unless you're authorized. And availability is all about making sure that it's available, up and running, the data doesn't get destroyed, so forth. So in an industrial control system environment, everything is about availability, making sure that the plant, the, the facility can keep running more than anything else. Because, you know, if you do a, you know, you have a computer reboot and it takes down the, the power plant, you know, people aren't going to have power. That's a bad thing. So, you know, there's been the whole discussion about getting more security in there. It's coming, but also a lot of the time is because of their focus is on availability, the their budgets, their you know what their organization looks at from a risk management standpoint, they see that there's other important things that need to be implemented first before we start getting the latest firewall. You know what we have works fine for us. Now with what happened at Olsmar, it sound it, it, somebody's credentials were stolen, and one of the easiest things that could have prevented that is to have some sort of multi-factor authentication, something else that uh, when you're authenticating yourself, you're doing it based on something you know, like a username or a password, something you have like a code from um, a text message or a code from an authenticator app, or it might be something you are, biometrics, uh, fingerprint, eye scan, whatever. Uh, but by implementing some extra lever of, of authentication, if somebody steals your username and password or gets a hold of it through a phishing attack or something else, they're not, when they go to log in, they're going, to, they're going to be asked for that other code. And if they don't have it, it's not going to let them in. And so that's the extra deterrent. Now there's hackers out there and there's a good friend of mine. They can bypass MFA and there's ways to do it, but it's a lot better than just having a username and password. You've got that extra layer of protection. It's like, if you've got your home and you've got your security system, having motion sensor lights or having cameras on the outside adds that extra layer of protection for you just to reduce your risk and make your, in this case, your home a lot safer or your 
um, your facility. So that's kind of my perspective on, on what happened with Oldsmar. Um, I do hat tip to them because of their incident response. Um, the guy discovered he had seen it move in the morning. He goes, oh, there are people that do log in. Okay. But when the mil 11 million thing value change is like, whoa, that's not good. And they launched their incident response plan. So they had it well, um, they had a, uh, they had their plans well documented and they were ready to execute on those and, and took the necessary action. So. John, yeah, do I you agree. want to add anything to that? Yeah, I agree. I mean, um, you know, that that's in, in that case, you know, their person was acting as the human firewall and, and really noticing something is awry and responding. It could have went um, worse in, in that case. Um, we don't know all the facts yet. Um, many of the facts will come out later as the investigation plays out. Um, you know, I can say from other incidents, uh, a, another thing to think about is a lot of times organizations will come to us and say, we had a, we were per penetrated because of a fish that happened to us. So we want fishing training and we have to tell them, you need to look at this a little more holistically because maybe it wasn't just the fishing training that was the problem. Maybe it was passwords. James mentioned someone pass passwords credentials were compromised. Well, maybe they were using a very weak password or a password that was compromised personally that they were using professionally, or Maybe they were po posting all kinds of information to social media, right? That then made it so easy for the hacker to go on social media and craft a phishing attack that was so like so precise that it was going to make it like you know so uh, clickable that they knew exactly everything that was going to the time of day to send it. I mean, they were posting what what kind of uh, you know with with the operating system in the background, hey, I just got my bonus check. This is when I get it, you know, you know, here's the, you know, back background, here's my operating system and everything. Um, so, you know, it, it, we have to look at these things a little bit more holistically than what fits honestly in a, in a soundbite or what fits in a news headline. And, um, and, and what fits in our knee jerk reaction oftentimes to these sort of incidents when they occur. And, um, and, and it, 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 a leadership takes a huge role in that as well is, you know, and, and I think Oldsmar again, did a great job in, um, you know, in, in their response um, in this case. And I think the, the investigation continues, um, but I think it, it is a, a warning sign that organizations, uh, it doesn't matter, you know, what your size is or what industry you're in, um, the trend continues. Um, that this is only going to continue and we, we have to educate our employees and we have to, you know, we have to think about it from a leadership perspective on, on how we're going to be, have, be in a state of readiness um, and be prepared. Well, and, but that still brings me back to the, the same question is that this is a psychological exercise, if you will, especially now in this ever-changing virtual environment. I mean, just technical difficulties, even with my program on a daily basis where, you are inundated with how you reach out to other people, your passwords, your social media feeds, um, and you and the world sort of mesh, if you will, right? They mesh professionally and personally. It's hard for the average everyday person to keep track of all this. So I was talking about the psychological aspect, but could you also tie, you know, your training and leadership, saying thinking it from a holistic perspective to the economic impact? of what this is costing individuals, entities, both private and public? Yeah, I mean, um, you know, <laughs> I, yeah, it, it, I mean, I'm sure there are economic reports that quantify, uh, you know, this sort of thing. Um, I like to look at it from, you know, what we offer at No Before, as I mentioned, is an employee benefit as well, because there is that mesh of, you um, you know, personal and professional. And, uh, you know, people are bringing their devices. I'm working from home. Most of us probably are working from home um, today. And so I, I want to protect my kids. I want them to understand their privacy online and, and what they're posting to social media. And I want them to be protected and the education we provide. We do have some materials for kids and we've made some of those uh, available for free as well. And so we want to make sure that um, you know, our, our youth and, um, you know, no matter who it is, understand, um, by the way, we also have a free home course 
um, that you know we offer um, that's out there uh, for folks to understand the implications at home. Um, but you know, it, it there are. I think it's a two billion dollar industry. Unfortunately, I think a lot of people are throwing a lot of that money at like hardware, and it's like, hey, we're going to fix this problem with a bunch of computers. And and I don't think that that's the answer. I think the answer is more education, more understanding, uh, and better leadership, and and leadership actually getting their minds around this and getting out in front of it. Um, and as I mentioned, measuring their culture within their organization, actually getting out in front of uh, folks, getting out there, getting to understand where are we, where do where are people? Because we don't want people in a state of panic, right? right. We don't want them. But 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 heightened awareness and and understand in education, um, as I mentioned, if we go to that monthly training plan, you, you get some confidence and you get the ability to say, OK, I understand what the threats are and I understand what what could be coming at me. And I have confidence and I have the ability to respond to some of these. And I know what my incident response plan is and I know who I can go to and I can ask these questions. And if something happens and it might be a little weird and it could be a glitch, might not be a hacker this time, I can at least go to them and say, hey, something weird happened. And it turns out it's a glitch and I'm not going to freak out about it and I'm not going to you know, overreact, but I'm at least going to point that out and, uh, and, and I'm going to follow through on it. And I think that's what's most important. We do have some questions and some of them you touched on, but just to elaborate of what can cities and I guess counties in particular do to prevent this from happening in the future. You, re, you mentioned having a response in place. I know at our own college that we do a lot of training and some of them are creative. I don't know if they're as creative as your video. The video was quite creative, um, but it does that, that visual of forcing everyone to be on guard, but what can cities do in particular? Because of course that has a different impact than a private company. Yeah, and I'm, I'm gonna kind of build on what John was talking about with regards to the culture. You know, your and what he was talking about with the, the spending. A lot of the times when you see the budgets, organizations have their budgets, they're spending it on the network configurations, more, you know, more firewalls um, or more endpoint protection, you know, anti malware for your computers or how to, you know, authenticate people that identity access, you know, all that gets up to about 95% of most budgets of their cybersecurity. They're spending about five on the human um, when it comes to security awareness. Now, um, for that, you know, considering the fact that when we look at phishing is it's one of the top ways that cyber criminals are getting into organizations and it, why are they keep doing it? Because it works and because they can go after the human. So it's extremely important that you make sure you're going through and you're providing that education to the, um, to the human, to your users, your employees. And I'm not saying that because I work with Noble Fall. I am, but more importantly, it's because you people will always say the humans are the weakest link. And I kind of go, all right, but they're your strongest asset because a lot of the time they're not aware. They just don't know. They don't know the signs to look for. You know, you think back, you know, 50 years ago when cars started coming out with seatbelts, you know, this thing you have to wear across and it's like, no, it's uncomfortable. I don't like wearing it. I got to take this training. I don't like doing it. I've got other work to do. But it was the culture of society, everything within the U.S. and the world, that when you got in the car, it was the norms, it was the unwritten rules, and eventually became laws, but the unwritten rule that you want to be safe, you want to make sure you fasten your seatbelt. Same thing here with the cybersecurity. It's going to take a while for the culture of the world to get on board and accept and be aware, not accept, but more or less be aware of the cybersecurity norms, you know, what you need to look for when, it, when you get a phishing email. Is it something you're expecting? Is it something that they want you to take some action very, very quickly? Um, and a lot of the time, if, if you can take that moment and just kind of go, all right, this does or doesn't seem right. Let me check with the person that sent it. If you can't, well, then they're, you know, you develop that sixth sense. You develop that that spidey sense, so to speak, within your own human firewall so that you can uh, be able to detect that and uh, know what steps to take. And that, again, that comes from that training. Uh, it's not something that's just got to be in the workplace. It's got to be at home too. And John talked about his kids. I've raised two daughters. Same thing with them. 
you know, making sure they understand what they're posting online. And a lot of parents aren't fully aware of that. And that's fine. It's just they, they're not aware. But if we can get that education out there, that'll make things a lot easier for folks. Yeah. And, and, and I, we, we have these things called the Sharkies and they're, they're our award. Um, and we've heard from a lot of good cities across the country who have submitted, um, you know, their, their plan of the year. And a lot of their plans were very, like some of them were um, using our products, using other products, which we have a question about other products too. We'll talk about <laughs> it a little bit. Um, and we're not downplaying like, you know, multi-factor authentication, do that. <laughs> like do some of these other things. Like just because you can still beat multi-factor authentication, we recommend doing all of those other things too. It's just don't spend 95% of your money on hardware and think that's going to fix your problem and only 5% of the humans you know, even out that percentage a little bit. But I would say some of the cool things that people have done have just been getting creative about getting this out there. Don't make it this this thing that, well, that's, the hackers are a, a thing that I just don't want to even think about, right? And I'm just too scared of. It's having, uh, it's hard to do in this virtual, but one of the cool things was like a fish fry that someone had in, in 2019, where they had everybody come out you know, they did a fish fry and it was about, you know, awareness and they had a guest speaker come talk about it and, and they made it an interesting thing. And everybody afterwards was like, by the way, this is about fishing. It's not about actual, you know, with the pH and by, and everybody after this is going to be getting an email fish. And that was just a cool way for them to be introduced to, you're going to be getting emails in your inbox from now on that are simulated fishing. And it's not going to be, it might not be fun for you, but we're going to be getting, you might click on some of these. Um, so making it fun and making it engaging and not making it punishment, not making it you, when you clicked on this, we're going to come by your desk and go, you shouldn't be clicking on those things, but, but making it more of a growth oriented experience, um, I think is, 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 you know, and, and, um, also handing out goldfish and, uh, you know, um, you know, those sort of things um, and make some of those fun play on words. And I'm, I'm the worst at this. Like I'm a get stuff done type of guy. So when, when you do the cheesy stuff, I, I, I'm not great at that. So I have to rely on some of my assistants and office manager people to be like, come up with something fun and cheesy. Um, but that really sometimes resonates with people. So um, that's what I, I would recommend that I've heard from some cities that are coming up with some of the, you know, just themed things to, cause it's a heavy subject, you know, no one wants to talk about cyber criminals. So sometimes if you take a lighter approach, it's a little bit more effective to break the ice for people. Um, so I'd, I'd recommend that. Well, John or James, do you want to take that question? There was a question in the chat about what other products or, um, you know, um, systems that you would recommend other than your own or companies in terms of products that you think are important or that you care about? John, I think you alluded to that question. Yeah. So, I mean, uh, you know, not, we don't really endorse any particular products at no before, but um, multi-factor authentication, um, you know, is, is a good, is a huge thing um, to enable. Um, it's not the end all be all, uh, but on uh, um, password managers are also um, having a good password manager. Um, personally and professionally is, is also good because it's impossible to manage all the passwords that you, you have. So you have one really, really long, complex, hard password that you remember. And then you have a, um, you know, the password manager handles all the rest of them. By the way, that's behind multi-factor authentication. And for those of you that don't know that, I, I've got a multi-factor means I've got to use my phone too. So I've got to enter my password and then my phone gives me a code and I've got to enter that as well. Um, so those are just two real quick that I'll throw out there, password managers and, and multi-factor. And I'm sure James has a, a couple. I'll, I'll top that off with making sure you're using VPNs, um, mm. that virtual private networks. You know, a lot of the times people think, oh, I only use VPN for work. I don't need to use it for anything else. But if you're traveling, once we get back to traveling, but traveling, using hotel Wi-Fi's, coffee shop Wi-Fi's, if you're going in with your laptop, like your personal laptop, it's a good idea to have a VPN on there because we've seen it where the bad guys will be sitting in the coffee shop 
and they'll be running, they'll be scanning the network. They'll be on that Wi-Fi as well because it's free and it's open mm -hmm. and they'll be scanning the network and they're looking for people trying to log into their banks. They're looking for people logging into Amazon. They're looking to collect that information. But if you use a VPN, essentially what that is, the easy way to explain it is it's like a tunneled connection between you and that provider that then puts you out onto the internet and it encrypts and protects your data up until you get to that VPN uh, service provider. And then you go out on the internet like you normally would. What it does is it, it encrypts that traffic, essentially, that when you're sitting there in the coffee shop. Think of it like France and England, and they've got the channel, that mm -hmm. body of water. You could take a boat across it, but you're subjected to all the elements, weather, pirates, I don't know. But if you take the channel, the tunnel that goes underneath the channel, you're protected from the weather and the elements and everything else. And you're able to come out the other side and off you go. VPN has always been a big thing. Um, the password managers definitely uh, use a password manager. I've got over 600 different accounts stored in mine, uh, along with my kids and my wife. Um, so it's a great way to be able to store that. Plus the security questions. When you have security questions and they ask you, what was your high school mascot? What was the name of your, what was the model and make of your first car? That information we could probably find out on social media. So we are, I always tell people, lie. Yeah. Don't tell the truth. <laughs> Come up with a different response because the way those questions were created, it's kind of like a password. It's like the Oracle of Delphi, right? You know, it's like, give me the password, open says me. You know, they give you that question of, you know, what was the model, make a model of your first car? Well, rather than say 1976 Mustang, which mine wasn't, uh, 1976 Mustang, I could put something completely different. I could have the word monitor. I could have camera. I could have light. You know, just something completely random, but then I store that response in my password vault just to have that extra protection. Because if somebody does the research on me, that open source intelligence research, um, or scours social media and finds that information, um, then they could use that against me. But if it's a completely different word, they're not, they're never going to guess it unless they get that password vault. And that password vault is encrypted and it's protected. And like John said, make sure it's got two factor authentication on it. Yep. I, I don't think you've made me feel any less paranoid about anything. <laughs> so, you know, and, and, I, and I know you mentioned it at the beginning, and I've been thinking about that in my head. You know, a lot of it, everything in security is all about risk. You know, when we get, and I'm, you're probably not going to drive now when I tell you this, but when you get in the car, you're taking that risk driving down the road that you could have an accident, right? You could be, and knock wood, it doesn't happen. But that's that risk that you take. When we're on the internet, we're using that. We're, we have those same risks. There are dangers out there. There are things that are out there that can harm us. But if we are aware of them and we know what to do in the event something comes our way and we can handle it, then it goes a long way. That's why when we're driving, you know, if we if we live up north and we hit that that uh, sheet of ice, well, then we turn into the the swerve or whatever, however it was. Um, I don't drive on ice, so it's been a while. But you, you learn the rules of the road. Now you need to learn the rules of the of internet and cybersecurity. And once you have those, that paranoia will go away. There's always a certain level of paranoia. Um, we get, John and I, we get fished twice a week at Noblefor. We, mm -hmm. you know, we're always, um, always scanning our email. There'll be something come in and I'll see it on my phone. And I'm looking at it, I'm like, yeah, it's just not something right about it. And I can't really look at it on my phone. So I'll wait till I get to my computer and then I can really look at it. And then I hover over the link and I'm like, ah, nice try. You almost had me. And I report that as a fish and I get the wonderful little message that says, congratulations, you caught one of the simulated fishing uh, attempts that we do. And it's at least twice it's, a week. I it guess. still feels good to catch the simulated yes. fishing. Yes, it's very it still good. It feels good to get the congratulations because you get yep. a little congratulations, even for me. After, after, after all years. this, yeah. no, it, it's, <laughs> um, I, and interestingly enough, it was my second week at no before. And I got an email that came in that said, uh, somebody in India has logged in with your, uh, your account. And I'm like, what do you mean? They like, I've only been here two weeks. How did they figure out my account already? And I turned to my colleague in the office. And I said, can you believe it? I've been here two weeks and already somebody's got the email address because I hadn't really shared it already got the email address. Uh, oh, hang on a second, turned back around, hovered over the link. And I'm like, it's not a Google link. Nah, okay, nice try, fish. And mm -hmm. I was like, whew, I almost clicked on it. And that was like week two, I would have been in real, really big trouble. <laughs> uh, not really, but you get the idea. Um, I would have been 
well teased by my colleagues. Let's put it that way. As a security professional, but um, but yeah, but it's a matter of just you know sometimes it takes. And I've that gotten moment. two real fish uh, emails since yeah. I've been. Um, yeah. Because I have you know my profile out there, so and that feels good when I didn't get the congratulations, and I'm like, well, I thought that was a simulation, and then they get come back to me later on in the day and say that was an actual fish this time that you repeat you. And, and that feels good. So once you gain the confidence and then you get the simulations and then you get the real fish, then you feel like, wow, I am really helping because I'm, I'm not a cyber, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm talking about this, but I'm an educator by trade, right? I'm, I'm in online education. And so I'm learning this stuff, although I have a technology background so I could speak to it. Um, but you do start to gain confidence and, and you can, you can learn this stuff. And I'm proof of that. Well, I can't thank you, um, gentlemen, enough because we're, our time is coming to an end. I think we have, we'll have so many more questions from this. So I hope you will share your links of some of the free resources that you talked about Definitely. and be open if we get questions after this, because often we do, um, to really discuss the nomenclature. I think that's going to be one of the greatest hurdles of, you know, this evolving industry that's constantly changing as new platforms arise, rise is how do we continue to educate the public um, and even though industry specific terms and how to address them. Yep. And of course, there's always an equity component to this um, in these in different challenges. So I can't thank you enough for sharing this information. Mm -hmm. And um, we're just going to promote our last program for the month. So thank you all for joining this program. We have one program left tomorrow. And that program tomorrow is with the Seminole Chamber of Commerce. We are honored to have Dr. Jerry Paris do a regional economic out, um, outlook with the Seminole Chamber of Commerce. It will be our first hybrid program since COVID in that we will have it um, live for the members of the chamber. And we will also have it virtual for those who just wanna tune in and learn about what's going on from the larger scope of the Florida Chamber of Commerce and how that's um, addressing the issues within our state. So thank you so much for your time and for joining us. And for more information about the Institute, please go to isps.spcollege.edu. Thanks again so much. Take care.